Our journey begins in the unlikeliest of places. 19th century St. Petersburg. At the entrance to St. Isaac's Cathedral. The city cold, the early morning mists dissipating with the approach of the sun, and our boots caked in mud. The year is 1860, and while St. Petersburg stands regal and proud, its inhabitants are nowhere to be found. It is quiet, too quiet. The population of St. Petersburg in the 1860s was, we are told, roughly 500,000 people, and yet there is not a soul in sight. Where is everybody? The long shadow of Alexander Column gives us a clue as to the time of the sun's journey above this region. Long shadows only occur during morning or evening. It must be morning, but it appears that no one has surfaced yet. If we travel 400 miles across to Moscow, we see the same thing. Empty quiet streets. In 1860, Moscow shared a similar population with St. Petersburg, roughly 500,000 citizens. But again, where is everybody? What about the rest of the world during this time period? Edinburgh, Scotland, 1840s. Copenhagen, Denmark, 1840s. Dresden, Germany, 1860s. Rio in Brazil, 1860s. Toronto, Canada, 1860s. Athens in Greece, 1860s. And then London, finally, people. And what about Paris? People, life. The first photograph, we are told, was created in 1822. The art of photography relies on methods of juxtaposition, of comparison and contrast to deliver its message and sentiment. In these old photographs, we do not find the same deliberate techniques of juxtaposition that contemporary photographers craft into their art but rather we find natural contrasts that are so important and central to navigating through our deceptive history. Contrast is a phenomenon, natural or artificial, in which meaning is generated and conveyed through the comparison of two opposing elements. 
When looking at 1860s Russia, there is an immediate contrast between the lack of population and the sheer size of these cities. Even in the 19th century, both Moscow and St. Petersburg are enormous. The infrastructure found in the photographs could hold a population well into the millions. Why are the cities so vast if the population was only 500,000 in each? Furthermore, the official narrative gives us a population that increases in a linear fashion from 1764. Many of the buildings we see here were built years before the photograph was taken. Did the Russians just plan well in advance? But it's when the population is introduced into these photographs that a new contrast emerges that is staggering. That is, between the people and the environment itself. It may be the reduced population numbers, or it may be the monochromatic starkness of the black and white images but they present to us something that we've lived amongst our entire lives and never paid any mind to. That is, the enormity and impossibility of the architecture. As we engage with the industry and act of tourism, we journey from place to place and observe, taking it all in, learning, hearing, and being told what we are looking at and how it came to be. And standing in front of a structure like the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, we might even exclaim, wow, how did they do this? But the moment, inextricably wrapped up in the busyness of the scene, perhaps prevents us from really asking that question with sincerity standing in front of a structure like the Arc de Triomphe while the crowd frantically takes pictures on their smartphones makes it all a reality. And we conclude, before being shoved away by new tourists, well, they had to have done it somehow because I'm here and looking at it. During our indoctrination at school, we are seldom shown old photographs of the grand cities scattered around our flat realm. And perhaps for good reason. Because when we marinate on images like this and are presented with the visual evidence of a very primitive Victorian people dotted around like grasshoppers within the shadows of the most magnificent, grandiose, brilliant architecture a human could ever imagine, we begin to have doubts. Indeed, how did they build this? The Arc de Triomphe is made from 36,695 cube meters of limestone and weighs 95,407 tons or just over 95 million kilograms. They tell us it took 12 years to build the giant arch in two different periods, between 1806 to 1814 and between 1832 to 1836. How did they transport this amount of limestone with the same horse and carts that we see in the photographs. Look closer at the four sculptures that adorn each of its sides. Look at the intricacy of the sculptures and the patterning of the ornamentation that frames the arch. Each section is perfectly repeated without any deviation or inconsistency. The first true power tool was not invented until 60 years after this arch was completed. They tell us this was crafted by hand. Is that even possible? 
And then there is the ceiling of the arch. Immaculate, 3D sculpted roses, perfect in their geometric symmetry. The nuance of the detail and finesse of each petal and cross-section borders is overwhelming. Look at the rest of Paris during this time. Again, a plethora of unbelievable, gigantic and magnificent structures. The city's infrastructure glorious and the people and their means of transport primitive, unsophisticated and seeming not at all developed to the point of producing a city like this. The roads are improperly paved and uneven. They are dirty and muddy. We also see buildings during this period in which the architecture aligns with the inhabitants. Buildings of misshapen proportions, less developed and refined, charming in their own way, but coarse in their use of wood and plaster. This is exactly the type of architecture we expect of a generation of horse and cart. A generation ignorant to the discoveries in technology that would follow in the years to come. Furthermore, at the time of this photograph, the arch is roughly 40 years old since its completion. Yet can you see how worn some of the parts of the structure are? We see weathering on the stone that suggests the arch is much older. As we approach the late 19th century, we see that the people of Moscow have finally decided to leave their homes and venture out into the streets. The infamous Red Square, now bustling with life. St. Basil's Cathedral and the Spaskaya Tower dominate the frame of the square. The construction of St. Basil's Cathedral began in 1555 and was completed in 1561, a mere six years. It suffered a huge fire in 1737 and underwent restoration over a 20-year period. But look at it. What a structure. Almost unreal and like no other. It is composed of thousands of red bricks and tin sheet metal that has been shaped into the distinctive onion domes we see. Look closer at the intricacy of the domes. How did they bend metal to achieve such precision and perfection in the 18th century? And again, if they had the skills and dedication to build a wonder such as this, then why are the conditions of the road so poor and covered in mud? We see these incredible structures and buildings everywhere in 19th century photography. We have the wondrous Crystal Palace of London, a monstrous structure with the greatest area of glass ever seen in a building and all constructed before England had automatic glass manufacturing. We have Westminster Abbey and Parliament. We have the old Euston Arch, constructed out of pure sandstone in 1837, and streets unpaved and full of mud. Why did these people not prioritize the streets they walked upon? The Frauenkirk, the domed masterpiece of Dresden, Germany. Its intricate and opulent splendor in direct contrast with the beat-up wagons and horse-pulled carts of the people below, a people dependent on the bare necessities, a people completely dwarfed by its size and majesty. The Library of Parliament in Ottawa, Canada, built over a period of 17 years. The first major settlers 
arrived in 1800 and at the time of construction the city's population was under 20,000. Would a grand, glorious library really be a priority for settlers? Why does the building look like it's been cropped out of Europe and pasted into Canada? Even at the turn of the century, 40 years before Bosch economized the power tool, we have the old Penn Station in New York. Look at the size of this. Completely mind-blowing proportions. As we can see here in the photograph, each octagonal sculpted pattern on the arched dome ceiling is larger than one individual human. Look at the gigantic columns and detailed asanthus leaves decorating the tops of each pillar. They tell us this station took six years to build. Six whole years. Yeah right. Why are we so gullible? Even with our access to modern power tools, printable construction pieces and crane technology, we could not reproduce this today. And more importantly, we don't reproduce this type of architecture today. The official liars of our world have an umbrella term for this type of architecture that we see in North America. They call it historism. Historism is a term coined to describe a style of architecture that is revival in nature, or in other words, copies the style of another period in time. The grand arches and buildings with giant columns we see are built in the classical or Greco-Roman style and the cathedrals are built in the Renaissance and Gothic styles of medieval Europe. Components of these particular styles of architecture feature large spires, arched windows, towers, turrets, domes, arcaded arches, sculptures, enormous doors, circular geometric windows, columns, clock faces and bell towers. Traces of this impossible architecture are literally found everywhere, in every city and across our world today. Some preserved and maintained, like the Parisian Arc de Triomphe and Notre Dame, and others lost and long forgotten to time like the Houston Arch and the old Penn Station in New York. We as a people travel miles to take our own photographs of these wonders. But the photographers of the 19th century gift us with something. Something they would never have expected to give a future generation. Perspective. We see a primitive people against a backdrop of clearly advanced architectural infrastructure. The official historians of the world tell us tales of Darwinian evolution and progression between time periods. The people that came after were always more advanced in their ways, refining and redefining the methods of the generation that came before. If the height of innovation and industry during the 19th century was still the horse and car as a means of travel, then, as these photographs tell us, this style of architecture was just as impossible for those living in the centuries before it. Anyone with a predisposition for thinking and questioning can immediately sense when looking at these photographs that something is rotten in Denmark, that something is off with the mainstream historical narrative, that something is not adding up. 
in a panoramic image of San Francisco in 1877, we see a collage of historicist architecture. We see columns adorning the entrances to very regal buildings that stand out like sore thumbs from some of the timber shacks surrounding it. We see gothic spires and towers in the distance. We see domed cathedrals and buildings. We also see just how sprawling and huge the city has become. In 1846, there were under 500 Mormon settlers living on the area of land in which we now call San Francisco. It was frontier land and ready for the taking. Between 1848 and 1849, with the start of the California Gold Rush, the population increased from 1,000 people to 25,000 people. 28 years later, this panorama was taken. The population at this time, we are told, was getting close to 200,000. Who in their right mind would believe this story? Does this look like a city of 200,000 people? Without any modern technology, power tools, automatic manufacturing, electric motors. A people in a strange, unfounded land, just making their mark. Do we really believe that a burgeoning people built this entire city in just 30 years? And again, such quietness, such stillness. This is a photograph of an empty city. Where are all the people? The shadow of the post here tells us that it is not the early hours of the morning. Short shadows only appear toward midday. A city of this scale at noon should be bustling with life. But there is not a single person in the shot of this panorama. The only life we see is that of a horse without any master in sight. It seems highly unlikely that all the people were told to stay indoors because a cityscape photo shoot was taking place. And this silent scene becomes all the more eerie when we consider that there is intention behind the lens. Someone was there, standing at a vantage point and taking this photograph. But who? And for what? And what are the chances that in the 19th century, during similar decades, we see deserted Russian, European and North American cities photograph like this? And then only a few years later, we find the same locations bustling with people. A people clearly incapable of building the architecture found in these cities. And what to do with these photographs? If we accept the narrative and these strange anomalies, then we stop here and get back to our busy lives. But the narrative we've received is not the truth and we shouldn't accept any narrative, no matter how official and certified it is, unless it makes sense. The people we see in these photographs and their early ancestors could not have built the magnificent architecture we see. It is an impossibility. Come on, jump in. We must venture further into these cities and look a little closer. There must be some clues waiting to be uncovered that helps us understand why these cities are empty. Wait, what's that you say? You want to wipe the mud from your boots first? Do not bother, it's a waste of time. Come on, jump in and let's go. For it is the mud that offers us some small clues as to what could have occurred 
during this time period. 